we are to be able to experience him today. That today, and that's what actually, uh, if I go into this story of the Good Samaritan, that's what this gentleman, and I'm not going to say who it is, who the author of the book is, because sometimes in this life, if you read up on an author or a teacher or anyone, and if you see some bad reviews or if you say, oh, people say, oh, don't, don't listen to that, don't listen to what they say. I'm one, though, that likes to get different people's opinions. And this guy loves the Bible. He loves it. He finds it fascinating. But sometimes he has just a little bit more in-depth look at the Bible than what you might have been taught. And it's just so fascinating to get somebody else's viewpoint. But, oh, my gosh, I overlooked this. And uh, it, it just makes, it, it makes the Bible come to life. And I think that's why he says, if you're bored with the Bible, you haven't read the Bible. So I'm going to talk a little bit, if it's okay, unless you have more than <coughs> to say. Nope, I think that pretty much covers it. Okay. We're going to go over this story. Uh, let me get back here a minute. Okay, here he is. This story here about the Good Samaritan is called, He Can't even say his name. And this is this is interesting. He says, or the reason why people miss the point of the Good Samaritan story. So, and if you want to find the story, I'm not going to read it all, but if you want to find the story of the Good Samaritan, it is in Luke uh, chapter 10. <coughs> Let me see here. Yeah, the parable of the Good Samaritan. So it's Luke chapter 10, and it starts in verse 25. So if you want to get your Bibles out and look that up, you can do that. But he says here, everybody knows the story about the Good Samaritan, right? It's about the importance of helping people who are in trouble. And yes, you could make it about that. And that might be helpful, but you'd be missing the point of the story. Here's why. Jesus tells this story in response to a question. And the more you understand the question, the more you can see just how brilliant and provocative the story is. The question is asked by a lawyer. You know how everybody loves lawyers. <laughs> no, actually, Even back in those days. Even back in those days, the lawyers know. The question is asked, and we know some wonderful lawyers, so we won't even get into that, but I'm just joking. The question is asked by a lawyer who wants to know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? A couple of truths about this question that this lawyer asks. First, the lawyer is a scripture expert. Okay? That's what lawyers were in the first century. So he would have already known all about the scriptures. So he's asking a question, but he already has an opinion. Have you ever asked somebody a question that you just want to get your opinion across, that you've already made up your mind about this? So it doesn't matter. You, you've already blocked your mind. You've already closed your mind off to anything that they have to say. You just want to make a point. Mm -hmm. So that's what scripture experts did in the first century. They had discussions about their opinions. This man is not new to the game. He's one of the elite, a long-standing member of the religious establishment. It's important to note that whatever Jesus says, this man will have something to say in response to it. That's a lot of people today on politics or whatever oh, else yeah. you get them into. They don't want to hear your response. They've already blocked you out before you've even given an opinion. They've made up their mind. It's done. They just want you to agree with them. Yeah. So this is what this lawyer has in mind. Second... When the lawyer asks about eternal life, he's not asking about the afterlife. What happens when you die was not something people in Jesus' day talked much about. And it wasn't something Jesus talked much about at all. The focus in the first century world that Jesus inhabited was this life, this time, here and now. Just what we were saying we missed out on. We missed out on that here eternal now. life here and now. Not life after death, but before death. So when you had a chance to interact with a great spiritual teacher or rabbi, that was one of the first questions you would ask them. How do I have my most, best, fullest life right now? 
Eternal life was that phrase people used to describe a particular divine quality of life, the kind that comes from living in harmony and peace and connection with God. That's the only way to have eternal life right here, right now, that full life, the best life possible, is to have connection with God. So Jesus, of course, responds like the good Jewish rabbi, asking the man what the Torah teaches. Jesus responds this way because in the first century Jewish world, the answer to how you have the best, most full and vibrant life was believed to be in the Torah. That's the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures, which would be Genesis, Exodus, etc. How does it teach you to live? The lawyer isn't surprised at all by Jesus' question to his question. Let's pause here and note that Jesus responds to his question with a question. This, once again, was not at all unusual for the day. Jesus is asked lots of questions in the Gospel, and he responds to almost all of them with a question. The lawyer isn't surprised at Jesus' answer that's a question because life revolved around the Torah. And so Jesus' answer that is really a question is how he would have expected him to respond. The lawyer then quotes Deuteronomy and Leviticus that loving God and loving your neighbor are the most important things you can do. They're how you enter into this particular kind of life called eternal life. So once again, when we love God, we love our neighbors, we enter into that eternal life, the best life we can have right here on earth right now is to love God and love your neighbor. Jesus then says to him, that's cool. Oh, wait a minute. Well, not exactly, he says, <laughs> but pretty close. Jesus responds, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Which is the end of the exchange, right? What else is there to talk about? Man asks a question. Jesus asks him a question about his question. He answers the question about his question. Jesus tells him he got the right answer. Conversation over. Except it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we aren't even to the Good Samaritan part yet, and you can already smell something that's up, can't you? Another parenthesis, just for good times. When people say the Bible, right here he goes, is boring, they're saying that because they haven't actually read it. Now, that we thought we read the Bible. We thought we read it when we put our chapter, two, three, four chapters in a day, and you make sure you allot X amount of time to do that. You think, oh, yeah, I've read the Bible. I got it all. It's all up here. I know it. It's here. It's everywhere. But Couldn't tell you what I read. That's right. And the depth and the background... Because if you have actually read it, and you enter into the stories, and the depth, we got to go into the depth, the background, and the context, and the innuendo, and the hyperbole, the one thing you will not be is bored. That's why it's so good to find a good study, and, and to get down into the nitty gritty of the Bible. The conversation isn't over because the text reads, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You know, he wants to make his point. Who is the neighbor? Oh, interesting. The dude has an agenda all along, he says. It's a setup. All that question and response and love your neighbor, blah, 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 was all a setup. The lawyer has an issue with Jesus. He disagrees with Jesus, and his questioning was to get to the point of conflict which has something to do with who your neighbor is. It's as if he says, yeah, 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 we can do the Torah all day long and agree that your loving neighbor is how you get eternal life, but we both know that you and I, Jesus, don't agree on who our neighbor even is. At which point Jesus then launches into the story about the Good Samaritan. A certain man was going to Jericho from Jerusalem and was beaten and left by the side of the road. A priest comes along and passes by the other side. Let's stop there. He notices something funny. He says, that's funny. The road between those cities was a trail a few feet wide with a wall of rock on one side and a drop off on the other. Jesus being funny here because there is no other side of the road. <laughs> 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 
Who would dig? Who would dig that deep yeah. to even pick that point out? Then a Levite, a religious leader, comes along and does the same thing. So you would think the Levite would stop alongside of the road. Then another guy comes along. Let's point out that the logical thing for Jesus to do in the story here is to make the third person who does a stop a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then Jesus could have made his point to the lawyer about how your neighbor is anyone you're passing by who is in need, which is how a lot of people tell this story. But that completely misses the point. It isn't a lawyer who comes along. It's a, wait for it, a Samaritan. And teachers of the law and the lawyers, the scripture experts, hated Samaritans. This is the, if you look up that, why uh, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other, there's a lot of stuff you can read up on it, which we're not going to get into, but they hated each other. This is the last character the lawyer would have expected to enter the story. Samaritans were the pedophiles who kicked puppies of the day. So they're the ones who mess with children and kick your dogs and do whatever, anything that's cute and cuddly, they were, you know. <laughs> but this hatred went way back, generations back, and it ran really, really deep. Kind of like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Go, yeah. But in this story, Jesus tells the Samaritan helps the man. This story would have been next to impossible for the lawyer to hear. A good Samaritan. In our day, when people use the phrase Good Samaritan, it is said without disgust or irony or most of all disbelief. We don't really pick up on why that was so horrendous. It's not a paradox now, but it was then because there wasn't a Good Samaritan. They didn't they, like, they, they hated the Samaritans. Them, yeah. they, they didn't think any of them were good. They hate them. It didn't exist. Jesus then finishes the story in which a Samaritan is the hero and asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? Boom, he says. <laughs> do you see how brilliant and clever and subversive Jesus is here? You can just feel the excitement in this man mm -hmm. when he is reading the Bible and discussing the stories of the Bible. I the, can see it in you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I find it so fascinating. The whole thing started with the lawyer asking Jesus a loaded question, didn't it? And so what does Jesus do? He tells a story that appears to ramble way off into the deep weeds, then a shocking character enters the story and ends up the hero. And then Jesus turns the table on the lawyer and asks, who was the neighbor? The answer is the Samaritan, right? But how does the lawyer answer? The one who had mercy on him. You realize what's going on here? The lawyer can't even say the word Samaritan. That's how deep his hatred goes. He can't even say the word. And this goes on to, to how it gets to today. Have you ever noticed how often people refer to the people they used to be married to as their ex? How rarely do you hear them actually say the person's name? <laughs> True. Names connect us. Names bond us. Names create intimacy. It feels terrible to forget someone's name, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, we forget that we all the time. I can remember somebody's face, know exactly why I know them, but I can forget their name. It's awful. Or I could, two days later, have it right on there. But this lawyer, he can't even answer Jesus' question by saying the name. He simply replies, the one, you know, who showed mercy. Well, that's your neighbor. That's who you're called to love. That's where the eternal life is found, not in some far-off distant galaxy. That is your life right here, right now. It's showing kindness to the one you hate, the one you despise, the one you didn't, wish didn't exist, the one whose name you can't even say. Whew. And that's hard. That's hard. That's hard. Now, he does go on to say, though, obviously, some people we do have to avoid. Some people we have boundaries with. Some people are so toxic and dangerous and hurtful. Some people have done so much damage to us that we have to keep our distance. But we can love them from a distance, he says. That's all part of being healthy. But even then, we forgive so that the hate and bitterness won't eat us alive. 
Do you see why I began by talking about the point of the story? You can make it about roadside assistance, which is fine, and maybe even helpful, but Jesus is calling us to something way bigger and higher and deeper and transcendent. Jesus is calling the man to love like God loves, which means everybody, even those you hate the most, even those who are the most difficult to love, even those you hate so much, you can't even say their name. <laughs> when you do that, you have eternal life. You have life to the fullest, to the richest life you can have here on earth when you love like God does. And I'll tell you what, none of us are living that full, rich, beautiful life because until we love like that, and that is a hard way to love. That is a hard way to love. We can only do that if God helps us do it. That would be a life in grace right there. A life in grace, God giving us his kindness, his gentleness, his compassion, his love, his forgiveness. We are to turn around and give that to others. And that's, that's, what, when, he's talking about. that's what he's talking about. That's where we find eternal life. That's, that's where we live and where we don't die. Because a lot of us are like dead people walking around. <laughs> We don't realize we do it. We don't realize we do it. and, and so, Sometimes we do, but a lot of times we avoid people without even really being conscious of it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. So, something we have to think about and pray about and move past. And uh, it's, it's a hard thing to do. But uh, if we stay in that relationship with God, if we keep Him in our lives and He is our focus, we'll be able to... It's he, get there. We'll be able to maybe I, say their name. I think he moves us to that point. Yeah, where we can actually yeah, can say, say their, their name. name. Say their name, so. Very good. You've earned the uh, right to pray tonight, honey. Ah, Douglas. <laughs> Douglas! <coughs> okay. We'll bow for a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for the gift of your mercy and your grace and your love, Lord. We just ask that you fill us with your spirit that you help us to love like you love, that we be the Good Samaritan, and that we can say those people's names that we don't like or that we can't stand or we just wish would just walk away and leave us alone, Lord. Fill us with your love that we can forgive, that we can, that we can care about them. And, and Lord, we just pray for everyone who is suffering now and who is in need of a relationship with you. We just ask for your blessings to flow all over them. And Lord, we just thank you and we love you. And we just thank you in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.